This video is all about the variety of properties that water has which allows it to act as a solvent. We've already addressed the notion that water has some polarity to it in the previous videos. One end of the molecule has a partially negative charge and the other end has a partially positive charge. We've talked about how this leads to hydrogen bonds when multiple water molecules are placed near each other. We also alluded to the fact that it's these hydrogen bonds that give water many of their unique properties. So the main property that we will especially be going into detail upon is water's ability to act as a solvent. What this means is that it's easy for certain things to be dissolved in water. This is really important to understand because a lot of biochemical reactions occur by being dissolved in water and then interacting with other things. This is what is constantly happening inside of cells and especially the cytoplasm. Since the majority of the cytoplasm is made of water, it acts as a solvent, which allows many interactions to happen between various types of molecules. Let's take a look at why exactly water is a good solvent and what types of things it can dissolve with ease and with difficulty. So the key feature that makes water a good solvent for a large class of molecules is because of its polarity. For example, if you were to look at some sodium chloride, often known as table salt, you would see that the sodium and the chloride are attracted by ionic bonds. The sodium has a positive charge, which means that it has an electron taken away from it, while the chloride has a negative charge, meaning that it has taken away an electron. Like we learned in an elements and atoms video, these are called anions and cations. We also learned that opposing electromagnetic charges attract which is what causes the ionic bond. Now if you put sodium chloride in water, something really interesting happens. Some of you may have tried this before and then realized that when you take some table salt and put it in water, it will dissolve. So why does it dissolve? We can take a closer look at both the sodium chloride and the water molecules. We now know that the sodium ion of sodium chloride is positively charged while the chloride ion is negative and also that in water the oxygen end is partially negatively charged and the hydrogen ends are partially positive. Since we know opposing electromagnetic charges attract, we can predict what is going to happen if sodium chloride and water interact with each other. The oxygen end of the water molecule is going to be attracted to the sodium ion. This means that the oxygen ends will go towards the sodium ion while the hydrogen ends will be repelled away from it. So when several water molecules and their oxygen ends are attracted towards the sodium ion, the sodium will begin to dissolve in the water very easily since it is also attracted to the partially negative ends of the water molecules. Something similar will happen with the chloride anion as well. Since it has a negative charge, it's going to be attracted to the partially positive hydrogen ends of the water molecules and vice versa. So now instead of the oxygen ends facing the ion, the hydrogenous ends will face the chloride anion. Once again, since the oxygen has a partially negative charge, it will repel from the chloride ion and continue to face the sodium. As we know, water has a very fluid nature, and so the sodium and chloride ions are also going to be able to flow past each other very easily. So you probably see something very interesting here. This is that if something has charge, such as an ion, or if something has polarity, it's very easy for it to dissolve inside of water, which is because the same sequence of events as we've just observed would occur once again. And so in the scenario that we've just observed, the water would be the solvent, which means that it is the substance that is dissolving something, and the sodium chloride would be the solute, which means it is the substance being dissolved. So for these substances that are charged, polar, and dissolve well in water, there is an alternative term for them, which is that they are hydrophilic. So if you look at the word itself, we can get its meaning in English. The hydro part relates to water, and the philic part means loving, or having a fondness to. So hydrophilic literally means water loving, which means that we can say that sodium chloride is a hydrophilic substance. So now that we understand how hydrophilic substances are able to incorporate themselves into water with ease and success, you might be wondering about what are some substances that aren't able to dissolve in water as well. 
The answer to this is that most substances that are not polar, known as nonpolar substances, are not going to be able to act as a solute in water very well. A good example of this is hydrocarbons. So if we looked at some hexane, which is a type of hydrocarbon and a major component of gasoline, we would see that this molecule doesn't have any polarity to it. As a result, if we threw some hexane into water, it would not dissolve all that well like the sodium chloride would. This means that things like hexane are known as hydrophobic substances. Once again, when we look at the word, it appears to mean afraid of water, as phobic means fear. So as we continue to indulge in biology, we will continue to see these hydrophobic and hydrophilic reactions, and the sequence of steps that occur when water acts as a solvent, which we now know of. All of these assets will become very useful as we near our cells unit, but for now, I thank you all for watching.